All right, so it looks like we've got about a critical mass of people here, so I think we're going to get started. Uh, first off, thank you guys all for coming. Um, these are part of our Monday night extended training sessions through COVID. Uh, they're put on by Division 176 here in Victoria, BC. For those of you who don't know me, my name's David. I'm one of the assistant to the training officers here at 176. We're really excited to have you all here. Uh, tonight, we're very excited to have a presentation by Dr. Chima, uh, our divisional medical officer here. We'll let him introduce himself. Uh, just as some housekeeping, during the presentation itself, we're going to keep everybody but Dr. Chima muted. It just keeps the focus clearly on him. As we're going through, if you have questions that come up, we'll ask you guys to type them into the chat box there and we'll address them at the end. We've had a couple issues with some previous ones about some less than factual and accurate answers and being given in the box there. So given that Dr. Chima is giving us his time as our expert tonight, we're going to ask folks to reserve the answers to answering of questions for Dr. Chima until he arrives, until he's there, just so we're making sure we're getting the best answers given there. Uh, once we've gotten through most of those questions, we will open up to a more of a free form question and answer if folks want to unmute themselves at that point. Uh, so at this point, I am going to mute everybody and unmute Dr. Chima. We'll have the slides pop up. Uh, just start going wild in the chat if the slides disappear. And we should be good to go from there. Thanks for the action uh, there, Dave. Good to see you. And uh, I want to give a special shout out to my home division back in, in, uh, in Victoria. Um, I don't get to see you guys as much as I probably should, but uh, it's nice to be a part of this again. Uh, I'll be coming to you from an uh, undisclosed location, so you won't get to uh, see my face. Uh, but as usual in COVID times between work and commitments and everything else popping up, uh, uh, can't really broadcast from home. So Dave's been kind enough to be, uh, be the slide person and sharing the presentation, and uh, I'll talk through it as we go. Um, I'll stop at natural points uh, for questions, and we can answer them kind of as we go. Dave will keep an eye on the chat for uh, questions, but um, yeah, we'll just get started. Uh, so yeah, my name is Nirav um, and we're going to do a talk on, I call it Airway Management 201. I usually do an Airway Management 101 talk for kind of the MFR, and then this is meant to be a, a bit of an advanced talk for kind of some advanced theories and things. So this does go a little bit above the scope of the MFR level, but um, does, uh, does go into some advanced topics that I think are helpful. Go ahead, Dave, next slide. Okay, so who am I? Well, I uh, joined 176 in 2006 uh, in Victoria. I was uh, previously assistant training officer and current divisional medical officer. I um, got in after completing my EMR in 2006. Uh, at the time, I was a student at UVic and completed a bachelor of science in microbi in 2009, and then went on to medical school at UBC, uh, graduating in 2013, and then started my residency in anesthesia at UBC, uh, for which I finished at 2018. Um, and then I started on as staff anesthesiologist at Vancouver General, which is where I've been ever since. Um, come July, I'll be leaving for uh, Sunnybrook uh, in Toronto, Ontario to do a trauma anesthesia fellowship before returning back to Vancouver to uh, resume duties for that. Next slide. Now, given that we are talking about uh, airway management, I do want to say that this presentation, all recommendations were created pre-COVID era and really just reviews fundamentals of, of airway management. I'm not going to be talking about any specifics about um, airway management and what's going to be happening post-COVID or peri-COVID or around COVID era times, uh, just because uh, the uh, recommendations are in flux and I guarantee that whatever I give tonight will change by next week. Uh, I suspect the fundamentals though of area management regardless will always be the same and I uh, just look forward to updates, or sorry, look uh, for updates from your local provincial uh, headquarters for uh, what to do. Next slide, please. To that regard, um, I was one of the members who helped create the uh, COVID intubation checklist for the province of BC. So uh, I have, do have some experience in that. Um, and it is on the provincial website if you want to have a look at what goes into kind of creating a checklist. It was an interesting experience uh, for me going through and creating it. And again, it, it's about adding the safety factor into the fundamentals and creating a process that's safe for patient and provider. Uh, and aligning the goals of patient care along with the goals for provider safety. Next slide, please. So what's all this fuss about airway and, and why, uh, why am I the one giving you this talk? Well, in anesthesia, we 
people to sleep and we do different blocks for pain and for uh, allowing patient to undergo surgery. But a lot of what we do is around airway management, whether it's sticking various types of tubes and cameras and other funky things into the mouth and placing a breathing tube or just supporting the airway and providing respirations. We do this quite a bit in uh, my profession and uh, it's one of the things that we get quite focused on and uh, do a lot of training around. So that's why I like to pass on a lot of the tips and tricks that I've learned from doing these in the operating room uh, at Codes on the Ward and Emerge and pass that on uh, to you guys so that you can use some of these skills in the field when you have to manage patients' airways. Next slide, Dave. So the thing about airway interventions is that when you actually look at our primary survey and you look at the number of interventions that are either uh, definitively involved with the airway or with the breathing, the AB steps of the ABCs, over half of them actually involve the airway, whether it's from opening, clearing, protecting the airway, giving oxygen, assisting in ventilations. Uh, even components of CPR involve a lot of airway management. And then as, when you get down to major chest injuries, you're doing interventions on the chest that are going to be ultimately affected by the airway, which is another reason why uh, learning good management of the airway is important for uh, managing the critically ill patient, especially in the field. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off with a little quiz here. Um, you can just think about it at home. Uh, no need to uh, type it in, but if you want to type in, you can. Uh, so what's the difference between the larynx and the pharynx? Think about that for a few seconds there. All right, next slide there, Dave. So the pharynx is the shared space that connects the oral and nasal cavities, whereas the larynx is specifically the upper part of the trachea. And this is important because, uh, why don't you go to the next slide there, Dave? When we're actually talking about airway management, we're talking about an area that's encompassed by various different roots, where we have the nasal tracheal area, the, uh, the oral tracheal, the oral pharyngeal, the nasal pharyngeal, all these different areas that we're working with. And depending on how you're managing the patient's airway, you're going to be doing an intervention at different points. And the airway really starts right from the front of the mouth, in the mouth through the nose, and goes all the way down in through the pharynx, down at the larynx, down the trachea, and down into the lungs, so the very tips of the alveoli. And all their interventions are going to deal with those parts uh, along the whole route. When you have an obstruction, it's usually going to be occurring from loss of tone, uh, resulting from the tongue falling back. And that's what we think of when we think of the most common cause of obstruction of the airways. Usually it's in the upper airway from the tongue falling back in the unconscious provider, and uh, sorry, unconscious patient. Um, and when you hear that snoring sound that you hear in some of these patients who might be decreased LOC, it's usually from that airway obstruction occurring. Now, it may not always be the tongue. There may be some other foreign body or vomit or something else in the airway. But uh, nine times out of 10, the tongue falling back and display and displacing that either with an OPA or a jaw thrust or something is going to fix that. Now remember that there are two roots of the lungs. Go ahead, uh, Dave. And what we want is we want to prevent um, bad stuff into the lungs. So you don't want to be having your trachea taking the job of your esophagus and having food and particulates and other things going down. Uh, you want to make sure that you have the two roots down either from your nose through the pharynx into the lar uh, larynx and trachea or from your mouth down to the pharynx and then trachea. Next slide. So a uh, nice little review of the uh, air, uh, airway anatomy here, but again, just reinforcing uh, the pass at the very top, you have the nasal cavity and terminates, which we're going to talk about a little bit more because there's some hints about placing nasal pharyngeal airways that I'll talk about there. Uh, we have the mouth and the oral pharynx, uh, tongue, major point of uh, obstruction, and then going the epiglottis, which is what helps separate the trachea from the esophagus and prevents food, water, and other things from in the trachea, and uh, promoting the all-important uh, cough reflex, or sorry, um, cough reflex for preventing food from getting stuck there as well. Uh, next slide there, Dave. So when you think about the airway and what you're going to be doing to it, there's really three questions you want to be asking. Is the airway open? Nope. Then not, we're going to open the airway and there's four different ways that we can do that. Is the airway clear? If it isn't, then there's three different things that we can do to do that. And if the airway protected, and if it's not, there's two, three things we can do to fix that. And these are really the primary interventions that we can do in each one of these steps. Now, I do want to be clear, that, uh, sorry, uh, using a double word there. I, I do want to... Um, make sure that people understand the difference between the three. So airways open means that there's an open path uh, that you've created that can be traced from the mouth, the uh, back of the throat, down into the uh, larynx and trachea, or 
from the nose along the same path. Clear means that there's no vomit, obstruction, um, uh, soil, uh, soilage or anything that's going to be in the path of the air. And protected means that if you stop doing your intervention or let go of whatever maneuver you're doing, that that airway will maintain its uh, present state and remain open and clear for the patient. Next slide, Dave. So opening the airway, I said there were four different ways that we can do it. And um, usually when I do this talk in, in person, I actually get the, the dummy out and, and and show some of these, but uh, some of these, most of these are uh, familiar from the, the um, MFR course. Uh, and uh, if not the uh, triple area maneuver and scissoring maneuver, you can look up some good YouTube videos for that are good. But essentially they all involve um, components of the same. So head tilt chin lift, most common way to open up the airway and get the tongue off the back throat, uh, lifting up from the bottom of the jaw at the chin and tilting the head back from the forehead, really extending the neck back and getting um, getting the uh, uh, pathway open and moving that tongue off the, the back of the throat. And there's some good cross-sectional videos of cadavers out there where when you, um, when you do that in the cadaver model, you can really see that tongue forward and get off the back of the throat. Now, obviously we can't do this in a patient who has a C-spine injury. And in that case, we do a jaw thrust. And that's where it's very important to reach back and get right behind the mandibles. And you're you're pushing the jaw forward in a straight line in the anterior posterior position. And you're essentially, the medical term is subluxing the jaw where you're providing so much force that you're moving it forward. Not so much to dislocate, but enough that you're pulling the jaw forward. And as you pull that jaw forward, or I guess technically you're pushing from the rear, you pull the tongue off the back of the throat. And again, prevent that obstruction that's the most common cause of obstruction in the unconscious patient. The scissoring maneuver is what you can use to open the actual mouth and look inside, look for debris, or if you have to get in there and suction. And what it involves is placing your thumb and forefinger together and then opposing them while they're in the tip of the mouth between the teeth, much as of what you can see in this diagram. And that helps you open the mouth, get a good view in there and get a look in case you need to suction or sweep any debris out or place an OPA. And then lastly, we have the triple area maneuver, which is really just a combination of all three. And uh, I'd suggest uh, after this presentation, go, go have a YouTube or a Google of triple area maneuver. It's a nice combination of all three. You essentially place both hands on the side of the patient's head. You use the uh, fingers behind the mandible to push the jaw up. And then you use one thumb on the lower jaw at the teeth and one thumb at the upper jaw on the teeth to open the mouth. And this lets you open the mouth give a jaw thrust and give a head tilt chin lift at the same time and really provide a nice open, clear pathway for air to go in there. And it's a natural position that you can have a partner stick a BBM on top and you can hold it in place and allow the partner to provide artificial respiration for the patient at the same time. Next slide, Dave. Um, here's just more of the same, just showing the um, same things we talked about. So at the very top left there, you can see the airways block from the tongue falling back. And then we're going to do a head tilt chin lift, uh, pushing down on the forehead and lifting up on the jaw and pulling that tongue off the back of the pharynx. In the bottom left picture, you see a child there positioning for uh, a jaw thrust. And I want you to pay attention where the provider's thumbs are on the patient. You can see that he's, uh, the, the provider has their thumbs right on the maxilla, which is the bony part at the front of the patient's face. And what that does is that provides you a mechanical advantage for when you're pushing forward on the jaw to do the jaw thrust. And the position where this provider has their finger really good because they're right at the angle of the jaw and they're gonna be able to push forward, so straight up in this picture and open up the airway that way. The, picture on the bottom right is uh, the best photo I can see of the triple airway maneuver. The only difference I would have is trying to get the thumbs a little bit closer to try and scissor the jaw forward. Um, but again, you're doing a jaw thrust pushing up with the uh, fingers and you're using the two hands on the side of the patient's face to uh, tilt the head back as well. So you're really doing a combination of all three. Uh, next slide, Dave. Now, part of the reason why we want to be doing uh, a good head tilt chin lift if we can is if, we, if we're able to, we want to try and combine it with what we call the sniffing position. Now, the sniffing position is something that we use a lot in anesthesia um, in order to optimize the patients for intubation. Intubation is a process where we place a breathing tube from uh, uh, through the mouth and into the patient's trachea to secure the airway and provide artificial respirations during surgery or during emergency situations, cardiac arrest, that kind of thing. Now, clearly 
that is well beyond the scope of MFR. But there is one thing we can learn from this. And one thing we do when we intubate patients, we place them in this what's called sniffing position. And it's a combination of cervical flexion and atlanto occipital extension. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that you're moving the lower part of the spine forward and you're moving the upper part of the spine back. And I'll have a picture of this to kind of explain this a lot better. But essentially what you're doing is if a patient is flat on the ground, you're lifting the head up slightly and then doing a head tilt chin lift. And that's all it is. And the benefit there is that you align three axes for air entry. The oral axis, so the path of, uh, right through the mouth. The pharyngeal axis, which is the uh, path at the back of the throat. And the laryngeal axis, which is a path down at the trachea. To achieve this sniffing position, um, what you need to do is you need to raise the head kind of off the ground, either with pillows or blankets, or, or um, if you have the stretcher, by positioning the stretcher uh, head up. And if you get a good 10 centimeters of lift from there, you should be able to help align all these axes to help open up the airway a lot better. Now, if you don't have a ruler on you, that's okay. Uh, in the majority of people, if you're able to raise their head up enough such that their ear is at the sternal angle, if you're looking at them from the side, then you'll achieve that. Now, uh, I got a picture of what that is. So the tragus of the ear is the, near the lobe of the ear. And the sternal angle is if you feel your sternum on your chest and you feel the notch right where the top of your rib cage is, and you just move down a little bit, you'll feel a little indent there, probably about two centimeters down. And that's where your uh, sternum meets your manubrium, which is the front part of your bone. And that's what we call the sternal angle. So if you have a, someone who's lying flat on the ground and you're able to lift their head up so that you can draw a straight line parallel to the ground from their ear to their, uh, that, ang that angle, the sternal angle, then they will be sniffed and their airway will be optimally positioned to be opened when you do that head tilt chin lift. This will be much more better explained when we see the pictures on the next slide. So what am I talking about here? So here are those three axes I talked about. You have the oral axis, which is the um, uh, axis straight through the mouth. The pharyngeal axis, which is the uh, line going straight down the back of the throat. And you have the laryngeal axis, which is the line going into the inlet of the trachea and then uh, down. And you can see that if we lift the head up off the ground, we actually get those axes as close as we can. Get them totally straight just because people have ligaments and other things to prevent that uh, extreme flexion. But we can get those very, very close. And you can see that this is essentially just an exaggerated head tilt chin lift to help the airway as much as possible. Next slide there, Dave. And what people have done is they've actually done studies in real people in, with MRIs and looking at uh, what's going on with the axes and what's going on in the airways. And this shows various degrees of neutral positioning head tilt by itself, just extension of the head, so head tilt, chin lift position, the sniffing position, which is head lifting, and that uh, head tilt, chin lift combined, or the sniffing position. And it's called that because it kind of looks like the patient's sniffing forward. So if you took the patient off the ground and stood them up, it would look like they were, they were kind of leaning forward to sniff some roses. Um, and, uh, and that helps get them in that position for optimal management. Uh, next slide there, Dave. And this is just confirming that the tragus of the ear, which is the ear lobe there, as you can see in the A, if you line that up, uh, you can see that when we go deeper into the body at the MRI, um, you can see that that tragus aligns with the pharyngeal axis, the middle one, so that when you raise it up, it helps raise all those axes as close as they can to help open up the airway. Uh, next slide there, Dave. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there for questions if anyone has any. Any questions there, Dave? Uh, looks like I can see one question here. I don't understand why the uh, head has to be 10 centimeters high for this to work. Great question. So um, that 10 centimeters comes from a lot of studies that were done in cadaver models and in MRIs uh, looking at this. And what they found was that that 10 position is what helps raise everything off and align those axes as much as possible. But that being said, any um, raising is going to help. So if you can only get them five centimeters off the ground, that's still going to help. That 10 centimeters is kind of more of a, a catch-all for the majority of the population. Um, if you want the more specific answer or the more kind of uh, individualized one for your patient, then it's getting the tragus of the ear, so the earlobe of the ear, uh, and getting that up off the ground so that it's in line with the sternum.
Thanks, Nav. Sorry, I had some issues unmuting myself there. That's the only question I've seen so far. So I think we can keep going unless anybody else has something they want to put in the chat now. Sure, I, I can always circle back to things as well. We'll keep uh, keep going. Okay, so we talked about how you open the airway. Next, we're going to talk about uh, clearing the airway. And so this is just essentially preventing any debris, uh, detritus, uh, soilage from getting in the airway. And there's three things that we can do to help uh, clear the airway. So we can position the patient in, for example, recovery position. Here, let gravity do the work. If patient vomits, it just comes out the mouth, drains down onto the floor. If uh, we have available a suction unit, either the mechanical suction from the, um, from the uh, uh, MFR bag or the electric suction that's in the vehicle, those can be used as well to help suck up the uh, debris. Note that your suction is only going to be able to suck up things that are actually going to be in liquid form. So if you have solid objects or uh, big chunky things like in vomit, it's not really going to work that well. Suction really works the best for more liquidy things. So like excessive saliva, secretions, um, even phlegm, but that, even that might be too thick or like really, really liquid vomiting. And um, finger sweeps are really going to be the way that you can, you can get rid of uh, big solid objects there. Now, the one thing that I would say is, is um, and while um, finger sweeps are helpful for getting rid of solid objects and big chunks of things, you want to be careful when doing that because fingers in the mouth can definitely cause injuries. Um, and uh, you don't want to have is put your finger in the mouth, eliciting either a cough or a gag, and then having the patient chomp down, especially when they're a little bit on the not quite unconscious, but not quite conscious either. Um, and so I'd only recommend finger sweeps if the patient's definitely unconscious uh, with no response to anything else. And really the best bet that you're going to have for helping clear the airway is a combination of positioning and, um, uh, and suction to let everything drain out at the time. Uh, and in fact, this is what we do in the operating room as well. If we have a patient who's under sedation and starts vomiting, the first thing we do is get them on their side because on their back, it's much easier for the um, food and vomit and other secretions to get down into the uh, trachea. Get them, the first thing we do is we flip on their side, let them vomit, clear the airway, and suction them at the time. Next slide there, Dave. Okay. So... Uh, OPA is oral pharyngeal airway, our, uh, my best friend, and I'm sure yours as well. Um, but it has another name that is used uh, after the person who invented it. So it, is it the Robertson airway, the Goodell airway, the Paddingway airway, or the Swath airway? Okay, five seconds there. All right, next slide, Dave. All right, so it's the Goodell airway. Uh, Dr. Goodell was an American surgeon initially serving in, I believe it was World War I, uh, and he helped develop the airway uh, to help maintain patients' airways um, in the unconscious state. Uh, his initial design was not like ours, where we have uh, a hole in the center and a, a hollow tube. It was actually more like an eye shape that was bent into the, sorry, an eye shape and cross section that was then bent to fit in the uh, in the patient's mouth. And there's some um, OPAs, depending on what manufacturer makes them, that are kind of built like that still. Um, but yeah, great invention, works great, and one of my favorite views. Next slide, Dave. Now, how are we going to protect the airway? So we talked about how we're opening it, how we're going to clear it, but uh, it's going to be hard to sit there and hold that position the entire time, especially when you have other stuff going on in the call or other things you have to do. So one of the great ways that you can protect the airway is by putting an OPA in. And again, this is basically taking the position of your jaw thrust, or jaw thrust or head tilt chin lift, and that's getting the tongue off the back of the throat and providing a clear passageway for air to get in. Now, sizing, there's, uh, I remember when I was doing my MFR way back in the day, and, I, and I'd keep hearing different things about sizing. And uh, there are two different ways for sizing, from the center of the mouth to the corner of the jaw, or from the corner of the mouth to the bottom of the earlobe. Um, and it can be either uh, when you're doing the, the center of the mouth to the corner of the jaw, you keep it in the natural position. So the way that you, it would be if it was sitting in the patient, when you do corner of the mouth to bottom of the earlobe, you can flip it around um, to get the distance right. To be honest, either technique works. And to be honest, this is a rough guesstimate. If it doesn't fit, you, you might have to upsize or downsize depending on what's going on. Insertion, upside down along the hard palate until you reach the soft palate and then twist 180 degrees and I, what I like to do is seat it with a jaw thrust and that helps prevent the tongue from being folded back as the OPA goes into the patient. 
Um, the majority of times, uh, there's various sizes available. Most kits have about two or three adult sizes and three or four pediatric sizes. Um, and a lot of people get hung up on this sizing about, oh, it's got to be the perfect size or not. If it's too big, what can happen is that the OPA might go down the back of the throat and actually push the epiglottis down and cover the uh, tracheal inlet and prevent air from going in. If it's too small, um, then you're not going to be able to get the tongue off the back of the uh, throat effectively as there still be some kind of tongue tissue with the back that's going to be um, uh, obstructing the airflow. But size it as best you can and if one doesn't fit then you can always um, uh, upsize or downsize depending on what's, where you were the, the first time. Now, a couple of warnings from Nignotov. Oral airway is only really tolerated in the truly unconscious patient. Conscious, semi-conscious patients don't really tolerate that quite well. Be careful when you insert it because it can cause some airway trauma because you are sliding across the top of the, the mouth. Um, and we already talked about what happens if it's too large. And again, even though there's an OPA sitting there to keep the airway open, you're still at danger of getting any secretions or vomiting or foreign bodies in there that can block off the airway, especially lower down. Uh, next slide there, Dave. So in the conscious or semi-conscious patient, a nasal pharyngeal airway or NPA is actually going to be your better friend. And these are much uh, better tolerated. Um, if we're sitting there in real life where I had my camera, I do my party trick where I put this in myself. Uh, uh, but uh, sadly, we, we don't get to share that. Um, sizing for the NPA, same kind of thing. Tip of the, no, uh, tip of the nose down to the tip of the earlobe. When you insert it, you're going to pick the biggest nostril you can. Now, uh, a good way to check this is everyone has a deviated septum. Even if, even if you think you're perfect and you have the most symmetric face in the world, everyone has a slight deviation of their septum one side or the other. And you can usually see this. When you look up your nose, you'll be able to see that on one side, there's a little bit more pink on one side to the other coming in from the middle. And that's the side that is deviated to. And so what you want to do is you want to put it in the other nostril because that's going to be your biggest one. You're going to aim the bevel in on the patient. And uh, the key with inserting these is lube is your friend. Um, having a well lubed NPA is going to help with insertion so, so much because you want to basically let it slide in smooth as butter um, in until it's seated well. The other problem I see when I see people inserting these is they try to aim up into the brain. And you don't want to aim up into the brain, you want to aim straight along the floor of the nose. So if you look at this picture here, you can see that um, the NPA is going down across the uh, floor of the nose and then it kind of tips back into the uh, oral fairing. And when you're inserting it, you want to think about that path that it's following. And you want to make sure that you're aiming straight down into the patient. Um, there are some times, though, that you wouldn't want to insert an NPA. So patients with a basal skull fracture, that's a fracture that's along the base of the skull that um, uh, can sit where that NPA is traveling. Uh, those patients, you don't want to be inserting an NPA in, and you'll know that the patient has this MFR, and trauma always talks about like battle signs and raccoon eyes, but in realist, uh, in reality, those take time to evolve. So it's very unlikely that a fresh trauma is going to have developed those at the time. Um, so basically what I Anyone with like major head trauma or you're concerned about a significant blow to the head, just don't use an NPA. Um, other things to make note of is a patient who's anticoagulated or a patient who has, takes blood thinners. So things like warfarin or Xeralto or Eliquis or any of these other blood thinners. Um, you you want to be careful about putting an NPA in these patients because um, if they start bleeding, they're going to be at higher risk of keeping that bleed. You put an NPA in one of them, then now you have a nosebleed and an obstructed airway. Uh, at the same time. So then you're in a bit of a world of hurt there. Um, and the last thing is pregnant patients, which we usually don't see a lot in the field, but um, the general rule I have is just pregnant patients don't have noses. Just, if you remember one rule, this pregnant patients don't have noses. And the reason is, is because um, the hormones that occur in pregnancy, estrogen and progesterone can cause um, swelling and edema in a lot of these mucosal surfaces and they're become more friable. So if you insert something into the nose, you might actually trigger a nosebleed to start. And then again, you're in a whole world of hurt because now you have an obstructed airway and a nosebleed going on and the patient's pregnant. Um, so yeah, pregnant patients don't have noses, don't put anything in the nose. Uh, next slide there, Dave. Now, I mentioned uh, in the nasal anatomy, these things called turbinates. And um, this is something that uh, a lot of people don't actually know that's in the nose. So let's look at the picture on the right here. That's a MRI, um, or maybe CT, CT, CT cross-section of a patient's head. 
And what you can see is in where the nose should be, there's all this stuff there. There's like three different almost um, like leaf and branch structures kind of sitting in the middle. And those are turbinates and those are mucosal covered kind of cartilaginous surfaces that are there to help provide humidification, help clean the, any air that goes into the nose before it gets down into the trachea, um, provides a lot of the um, nasal secretions that help clear the nose as well. Uh, when you have a runny nose, this is often what gets inflamed at the time. And these things get in the way because if you look at the image, I think about where your, your uh, nasal pharyngeal airway is, they're kind of in the way. And this is why uh, it's important that you wanna be putting the nasal pharyngeal airway in at the very base of the nose because that's gonna get underneath that large inferior turbinate, the lowest one, and it'll kind of raise it up into that open area and get it back into the far uh, back of the uh, back of the um, nasopharyngeal uh, cap. Next slide, there, Dave. All right. Uh, maybe I'll just pause there for questions because I saw one come up in the chat. Um, do you recommend keeping the airway open with head tilt? chin lift or jaw thrust before inserting airway. Um, you probably won't be able to maintain the head tilt, uh, sorry, the jaw thrust as well when you're inserting the airway just because of the amount of force going in. So I would do the head tilt chin lift if you're able to, if there's no contraindications like a C-spine injury or that kind of thing um, uh, when you put the airway in. And if you actually get that head tilt chin lift going, you can hold one hand on the patient's forehead to maintain that head extension. And then you can put the oral airway in. Once you have it to the back of the um, once you have it uh, in, you can seed it by then letting go of that head tilt and doing a jaw thrust, and that'll help keep it in position. I think that was the only question I saw. Yeah, okay, so I'll keep going here. All right, now a little bit of a history question here. In what year was the recovery position invented or discovered? These are more just random facts that I like when I'm learning about airway stuff that I found interesting. All right. Next slide there, Dave. Yeah, so I saw one person say, be there. Yeah, 1891, so over 100 years ago. Um, and it was originally uh, in a paper that looked at patients who had had stroke. And back in 81, we really didn't have much treatment for stroke patients. I just had to leave them to their own devices and see if they recovered. And what they found was that there were patients who had stroke who were um, dying uh, in the middle of the night when no one was taking care of them because they would get more weak and they're destruct and there'd be no way for them to uh to clear it and, and fix everything so um they would be placed in the recovery position on their side and that would help keep their airway open especially at night when they slept um and the the paper that it was from uh which i love these old these old timey names on stertor apoplexy and the management of apoplectic state which is basically management of, of stroke. And um, stertor back in the day was what we now call strider or that obstructed noise sound. And that makes sense because that's the sound of that tongue falling back or other secretions and things getting in the way. So you place a patient in the recovery position after they had a stroke, if they aren't able to control their airway, at least it's gonna be open and draining so they don't build up any secretions. Next slide, please. So positioning great way of keeping the airway open and preventing anything from getting in. As I said before, let gravity do the work, let all secretions flow down uh, uh, out of the airway rather than down into the trachea. And it also allows a soft palate and tongue to kind of hang forward and, um, uh, and uh, not obstruct the airway if they're lying on their back. Now, a lot of um, uh, courses kind of I guess I'm really aging myself, like more than 10 years ago for first aid courses. You say don't put patients with C-spine injuries in recovery position, but um, if you use the Haynes position, which is high neck, neck something, something. Wow, <laughs> I'm uh, really forgetting it there. High arm and neck. Uh, it'll come to me afterwards. Anyway, basically just bring their lower, the side that they're lying on, their arm up before you flip them on their side, that keeps the head in neutral position as you can, and it really helps keep the airway open. Um, there's, I'm not gonna go, high arm and endangered spine, thank you, perfect. Um, so it, a, a lot of patients are always worried, or sorry, not patients, a lot of providers are often worried about 
creating a C-spine injury. And you should be when you're dealing with C-spine patients. But remember that when you look at the list, it's always ABCs and we control the delicate spine first. So DABC, we're still going to keep that patient open because what's worse for a C-spine injury is asphyxia and death than um, the C-spine injury. And using that high arm position, maintaining that C-spine neutral, getting them on their side and keeping that open, especially in the r rural or um, solitary setting where you find someone like this and you have to go and get help, placing them in, the, in that uh, hand position can be uh, quite useful. Next slide there, Dave. Now, I, I keep saying that this, these are ways that we're going to be protecting the airway, but um, it's a bit of a misnomer because even though we are leaving the airway at, uh, at the time, if we pop an OPA and the patient's breathing okay with it, and, um, no airway is truly secure until you have a completely sealed connection from the outside to the inside. And what I mean by that is that regardless of what you're putting in the mouth, whether it's uh, or nose, whether it's an OPA, NPA, or this recovery position, there's always a chance that someone's going to slip by and get down into the trachea. And so we say that no real airway is protected fully um, until you have a tube going either through the mouth or through the nose, like in this picture, um, all the way down with a cuff, a little balloon there that sits in the trachea to help seal off the airway and prevent stuff from getting down. Uh, and that's what we do in the operating room where we intubate patients and we put a breathing tube down like that. Um, and and uh, the main point I want to stress is that even after you put that NPA in or you put them in recovery position or you're holding that that uh, head tilt chin lift or jaw thrust, you always want to keep reassessing the airway and making sure that there's nothing uh, obstructing it, nothing falling down, no secretions getting in there. Next slide there, Dave. All right, I think I'm going to uh, pause there for any questions, if any came up, and I'm just going to have a little sip of water at the same time. All right, we'll keep going then with breathing. Okay, so when we are looking at breathing, we're really asking two questions. Is it adequate to be maintained? And if it isn't, do I need to intervene at the time? And there's a whole host of other interventions that we can do at the same time. Are we going to be providing supplemental oxygen? Are we going to be taking over? respirations completely with artificial respiration. We want to auscultate the chest and try to find some kind of pathology that might help us intervene more if needed. And do we need to change the patient's positioning to make their ventilatory mechanics or their ability to breathe easier and better for the patient? There's so many times I've come and I've seen patients who are having difficulty breathing and they're lying uh, flat on their back. And really that's one of the worst positions you can be at pulmonary mechanics. If you think about it, when you're on your back, you have all your abdominal contents that are pushing on your diaphragm that you're having to fight against to take that deep breath in. And you're losing a lot of mechanical advantage that you have from your rib cage as you're trying to breathe. So sitting a patient up, letting them sit straight up into a more mechanical advantage posi advantageous position for breathing um, will help with those patients who have difficulty breathing. And... Uh, I have a whole talk on patient positioning. Um, maybe maybe a future date we can we can do that one. But I, I go into kind of pulmonary mechanics a little bit more. But I guess when you see a patient who's tripoding, as we say, so leaning forward with both hands or arms rest legs, that's one of the most maximal um, maximally effective positions for ventilation from a patient's effort point of view, because that allows that diaphragm to fully expand down and allows the chest to be recruited to really raise the rib cage up. And you see that in very extreme states of um, difficulty breathing and shortness of breath. Next slide, Dave. So uh, we're going to be talking, however, more on interventions that we're going to be doing, uh, which in this case, I'm going to be talking about bag mask ventilation, not to be confused with the BVM, which is a bag valve mask, which is what you do to which is what you use to do BMV. Uh, that's my one joke that I'm putting in the, in the presentation. Um, and really the key with using the uh, bag and mask when you're providing artificial respirations is creating a good seal on the patient's airway. And if you're by yourself and you're having to do it by yourself, the key to doing that is a good, what we call CE clamp that you create with your hand. And I'll show this in a, in a slide coming up, but the, with using a CE clamp, you're pulling the face mask rather than pushing the mask down on the patient. And if you think about what we were talking about previously with uh, having the, having the uh, airway opened, when you push the mask down into the face, you're actually pushing the jaw back and bringing the tongue with it, which is going to cause 
a lot more obstruction of the airway than uh, if you're trying to pull the jaw up. Because by effectively pulling the jaw up by using that CE clamp, you're going to be doing a jaw thrust at the same time and getting that tongue off the back of the, off the pharynx. Next slide, Dave. So errors that I commonly see with learners when they're trying to do bag mass ventilation, uh, we'll just go through a couple of them here. Um, so smushing the face down. So what do I mean by that? So that's really what I was talking about before is when you're pushing the mask down into the patient's face to create a seal rather than pulling the patient's jaw and face up into the mask. And again, the most important point from there is to bring that jaw up to do that kind of effective jaw thrust at the same time. Um, when you're wrapping your fingers around the E portion of your fingers, the, the digits three, four, and five into the jaw, I see a lot of people kind of reaching forward and trying to hook in a lot and they end up actually compressing the soft tissue structures. Now, um, and uh, it isn't as much of an issue in large, robust adults, but when you get older patients, smaller patients, or particularly pediatrics, that can actually obstruct their airway completely. And so what you want to make sure is with those three fingers that you're wrapping around the bottom end of the jaw, you're really getting the bony part of the jaw and you're compressing that and you're not cheating and trying to reach around more and uh, compressing a lot of those soft tissue structures. Um, there's two components to artificial respiration. One is getting a good seal on the mask. The other is uh, providing the actual respiration portion, the force behind the squeeze. And uh, you want to remember it's a nice gentle squeeze, one third to two thirds of the bag, gentle force and allowing enough time for expiration so you don't build up a positive pressure. And you want to keep that pressure low because you don't want to be um, bagging with too much pressure such that uh, you're actually forcing air down into the stomach. Because as you start to pressurize the stomach, you're going to be building up pressure, and that can come up with a vengeance when the patient vomits all that stuff all over your scene. Um, the other thing is use your adjuncts with you, adjuncts being the oral pharyngeal airway or nasal pharyngeal airway, because even with a good jaw thrust or a good head, uh, head tilt chin lift, eventually your hand's going to be getting tired, and you're going to start to loosen your grip, and you're just going to be obstructing, you're going to be fighting. So getting that OPA in early and really helping provide that clear route down to optimize your bagging as much as possible. Um, patient positioning can be an issue as well. As I mentioned before, having someone flat on their back when you're bagging them can make it a lot more, uh, your job a lot harder because you're fighting not only against the patient's um, unconscious body, but also against the force of their abdominal contents of their di diaphragm. And if you raise a little bit, either if they're on a stretcher, you can raise the head up. If you get some pillows underneath them, you try to um, reverse Trendelenburg them, so raise them up a little bit. You take a lot of that pressure that the abdomen is applying on the chest and diaphragm off and allow your bagging to be a lot better. Um, and then the last thing you can try and do, and this is a bit more an advanced maneuver, is what I call confirm your ventilation. So if you have, what I mean by that is that in the operating room, we have fancy monitors and all this other stuff that let us see the end tidal CO2 being expired on the patient. It lets us know that the air that's going in, we're then exhaling and we have a, air, a continuous path of air in and air out. But you can do this in the field, especially for your first breath that you, breath that you get in the patient. And what you can do is, is that you can look for misting on the mask. And when you give that first breath, if you see good, clear misting coming back, that's usually a good indication that you're getting good ventilation. Now, you could also be blowing up the stomach and getting, and getting air back, but usually you won't get as much of a misting back as you do. And especially if you have continuous ventilation where you clear that misting and let that exhalation come through, you'll be a bit more um, happy with the sense you're getting good ventilation down into the patient. Uh, now, that won't last forever because missing is a more function of the temperature of the mask and the relative humidity of the patient's breath, but it's uh, nonetheless a good um, uh, surrogate to use to help know if you're bagging effectively or not. And uh, I do always stress that bagging is probably one of the, the most life-saving maneuvers we can do, maybe apart from CPR and, and uh, defibrillation, um, particularly because um, uh, the majority of patients can be managed with a bag mask ventilation. And there's a lot of studies uh, looking at this. And, and what they found is that of all the patients, when you try to manage their airway in different ways, whether it's bag mask ventilation, intubation, which is putting the breathing tube in, using another kind of airway device like a king tube, a laryngeal tube, or going cutting their neck in a surgical airway, which again, well beyond the level of MFR. But if you look at all these patients, um, the vast majority of patients, though only seven out of 10,000 patients, cannot be managed by bag mass ventilation alone. In other words, you can't provide respiration for them with just bag mass ventilation alone. 
And that's huge. That's, that means out of 1,400 patients that you might see in a year, there's only one that you won't be able to manage in that regard with proper positioning, technique, optimization of adjuncts, and um, use of tools. I think that's really important to remember because you can keep the majority of people alive with uh, artificial respiration and bag mass ventilation than you can with all the fancy stuff we do in the OR, putting tubes in various places with fancy cameras and equipment and other things. And um, it's one of the key things I teach, especially to my learners, is that this is what's gonna keep people alive longer. And people get very fixated, especially in hospital codes, uh, code blues and cardiac arrest of trying to get the get the breathing tube in and you can keep someone alive by just artificial respiration simple bag mass ventilation next slide Dave so here we see a couple examples of bag mass ventilation uh, top picture is single provider hand in the bag uh, with a good CE clamp there uh, and you can see that they've got uh, their C portion, the thumb and the uh, pointer finger at the top forming the C, and then three fingers at the bottom of the jaw there forming the E. Um, this is on a dummy, but I would, uh, so it's not quite anatomically correct, but I would say that there's probably a little bit of cheating going on there with the fingers wrapping around a bit too much of the soft tissue. Provider also has his hand um, through the uh, hand strap there, which I think is okay. I personally don't like doing that because I, it, it kind of traps your hand in the bag. So if you have to respond or grab something quickly, I, it kind of limits your response time. So I actually like holding my bag from the bottom uh, and squeezing kind of under, from underneath the bag because um, you can rest your hand on your um, thigh or on something else or on the floor as you're bagging and it'll help prevent you from being tired. And you can sit there and be comfortable like that all day. Um, if you have two providers and one of you is going to be focusing on getting that nice seal with the mask, then you're going to do the double CE clamp. So same things, having your fingers uh, touching or almost touching if your hands are small, and then getting both hands around and lifting that jaw up into the mask. Now, alternate technique can be used other than the CE clamp is the VE, um, is the VE clamp. And you can see that in the picture in the bottom right. And the difference here is that what we've done is we've moved our hands up and we're placing our thenar eminences, eminences, which is the thenar eminence is the uh, part on your hands. So if you look at your hand and you look at the kind of meaty pad at the base of your thumb, that's the thenar eminence. And you're putting that on top of the mask and then you're using all four fingers to reach around to the bony part of the mandible and really pull that jaw up into the mask. Now you can only do this if you have two hands to create your seal. You can't create as good of a seal when you're using um, if, with one handed only. But um, if you if you're, uh, can do this, you'll have much more mechanical advantage to pull the jaw up into the mask and uh, really create that seal for uh, helping you bag. Next slide there, Dave. And it's just showing you another picture of that CE versus VE clamp and, and kind of showing you why the different pictures are labeled that way. CE, we have the C at the top with the E at the bottom grasping onto the mandible. I would say that um, can probably sneak those, that fourth and third finger down on the CE a little bit more just to get a little bit more behind the mandible. But there you can see the nice VE clamp really grasping the whole mandible, bringing it up into the mask. Uh, and again, only can do that if you're using a two-handed technique to create the seal. Next slide, Dave. Now, if you're gonna be using a two-handed technique, you need to be using your partner to squeeze the bag. Um, so what I'm trying to uh, just remind you is don't forget to use your partner. If you can't get a good seal by yourself while you're trying to bag, use your partner to squeeze the bag, use both hands, get, the, um, uh, get that good seal with the jaw. And uh, there's a mnemonic from Jaws, which I uh, stole from uh, Life in the Fast Lane. They have a good article on bag mass ventilation. Um, with some good videos on it as well. So I encourage you to check it out after if you want to see some more uh, examples. Um, but uh, jaw is a good mnemonic. So use a jaw thrust, insert an oral or nasal airway to work um, uh, to uh, make your airway path uh, less obstructed. Um, work together. So you use two hands to create the seal and have your partner squeeze the bag. And remember, slow, steady, and um, uh, small squeezes. Uh, a third, one third to two thirds of the bag over one to two seconds, let enough time uh, elapse for exhalation and uh, keep your rate low, less than 12 breaths per minute. Next slide there, Dave. Uh, maybe I saw a couple of questions pop up here. So skin color, I'm assuming that you were referring to um, 
how do we know if we're getting good good ventilation or not yep so skin color if the patient's if the patient's cyanotic we're probably not doing a good job of uh of begging the patient um but uh you know skin color might be a little bit delayed especially when that first breath goes in and you know it's good uh but good answer if the patient's still blue and you're begging then you probably got to change something in your bagging before they get better uh and then the other question i saw here was does the positioning have to be exact if you meet the criteria sealing the mask to the face no if you've got a good seal without having that positioning that's perfectly Fine. These are things that you can do to optimize your positioning. So if you arrive on the scene, unconscious patient, you plop that mask on with a normal CE grip or just plop that mask down and are able to get a good seal, then keep begging and you, you'll be totally fine. These are just tips that you can use to help optimize your begging. Or if you plop that mask down and you can't get a good seal, you can't beg, these are some tricks that you can do to help um, improve your, uh, your begging ability. Now, um, the bag mask, there's different uh, types that are out there. There's different companies that make them. They go by various trade names. There's Ambu bags, Laridol bags. Um, and uh, they all basically they'll have the same components. You have your actual mask. You have an expiratory, uh, inspiratory valve, which is a three-way valve usually. Some bags come with a peep valve. We'll don't think that any of St. John's have a peep valve, so we'll just ignore that. And I don't think that any of the ones at St. John also have a pop-off valve either. So just ignore those two points. You have the actual bag that you squeeze. And then at the back, you have this kind of complex series of different types of valves and inlets to allow things to happen. And then the very, very back, you have your reservoir bag. So um, at the very back of the, of the, of the uh, apparatus, um, what you have is you have your oxygen inlet which goes into a, a three-way system, which allows oxygen to go in, and it'll go and flow into the reservoir bag. And that creates a reservoir of essentially 100% oxygen at that point that has an overpressure valve that allow excess air to breathe off. But if the bag is empty and all, you don't have an oxygen source available, it also has an air inlet that air can be um, get into the main self-inflating bag, which is what you're going to be squeezing when you deliver the breath to the patient. Um, the expiratory valve, the three-way expiratory valve at the very front between the mask and the self-inflating bag portion, um, that valve is what's going to prevent um, air from going back into the bag when it's exhaled, and it's going to allow it to come out the the uh, pop or uh, out the exhalation port at the front. Next slide there, Dave. Okay, so um, you were meant, we were talking about how these are tips that we can use to optimize patients but uh, for bagging, but there's gonna be some patients who are gonna be difficult to bag um, uh, regardless of what you do, or sorry, I shouldn't say that. These are patients who are gonna be predicted to be difficult to bag unless you optimize your bagging technique. And I should, I should probably point out before I, I, I give too much of a sense of grandeur here that that statistic of of only seven out of 10,000 patients can't be bagged. That's with an experienced provider, uh, which in all these airway studies is usually a senior or consultant and the anesthesiologist. So, um, and, and that's why I wanna teach you guys these tricks and, and uh, teach you guys which patients are gonna be difficult to bag um, so that you can optimize them and know which patients are gonna be more difficult because your numbers are gonna be a lot higher than, than the ones presented in that paper there. But uh, if we teach you good technique, um, and learning how to optimize your positioning and your adjuncts, then you'll be able to conquer uh, any airway by, by no time. Um, all right, so uh, there are some patients who are gonna be more difficult to bag than others. And uh, there's a good mnemonic out there, uh, for, um, which is BONES, uh, which stands for beard, uh, obesity, or obstetrical or odd faces, no teeth, elderly, and snores. And we'll go through each of these, but I just want you to remember that picture of Santa Claus there, and we'll swing back to that at the end. Next slide. So why does a beard make it difficult for someone to be bag nest? Well, beard is this um, uh, heterogeneous, uh, kind of soft, fluffy, very air-filled structure on the front of a patient's face. And I describe it like that because when you try and plunk that mask onto the, the face, you're not gonna be able to get a good seal because there's all this hair and little air channels and, and pockets that are preventing you from getting that good seal. And the other thing that might happen is that a lot of times uh, people with beards make it difficult uh, for you to actually assess their airway. And what they might have underneath is a bit of retrognathia. What that means is that their, their lower jaw is actually held at a more posterior or backwards position than, than the majority of patients. And this is just an anatomical variant. It's why we all look different. But what this means is that if that jaw is naturally in a more backwards position, then that tongue is gonna be closer to the back of the throat. Um, and when the patient goes unconscious, it's gonna be even closer to the back so that it can cause obstruction.
So how do we fix this? Well, really it comes down to how do you actually create a good seal with this? Well, you wanna optimize your airflow as much as possible. So good jaw thrust, trying to decrease all those little air pockets that are created in that hair. Use an OPA to help decrease the amount of force you need to get air down and into the trachea. And you can use something called an offsite mask. And what that is, is you take a piece of offsite or tagaderm, fold it in half and you cut a little half circle in it so that when you unfold the tagaderm, you have a little hole in the center. Then you peel the backing off and you apply the sticky side to the face. And you need a really big tagaderm to do this. You need one of the big kind of um, uh, four inch by three inch tagaderms. But what you've done now is you've essentially flattened all that tiny air pockets and created a flat surface for you to seal that mask on into. And I wish I had my camera so I could show you what this looked like. But um, what you've done by doing that is you've uh, created a nice flat surface so that when you plunk your mask onto the face, you don't have those little air pockets and little hairs that are creating all those little channels. You have a nice flat surface and you can compress down and create that nice seal to allow air to go in. Now, this may complicate uh, airway management because you've got this sticky thing on your face. You might have to take it off. You have to suction or open the airway more. But in uh, uh, patients with big bushy beards that you need to just get out of the way, it's a great bailout and will definitely help you uh, improve your chance of success for bag mass ventilation. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me go into obese and obstructive patients. So these patients are difficult to bag because um, they have a lot of intra-abdominal pressure that's pushing on their diaphragm that you're going to have to be fighting against when you want to try and inflate their lungs. Um, and it makes sense for obstetric, uh, sorry, for obese patients. We have all their abdominal uh, obesity and girth that's going to be pushing down on their abdominal contents and then onto their diaphragm and chest. Uh, Aesthetic patients, what you have essentially is a baby that's doing the same thing um, in their abdomen. Uh, and you need higher pressures because you need to fight against all that pressure that's pushing down on the diaphragm and abdomen to help expand the chest out and allow air to go in. And this can be fixed with uh, essentially ramping the patient up and decreasing any upper airway obstruction that you might have by inserting an OPA. And there's a uh, famous pillow out there called a troop pillow, which is essentially a um, right angle triangle wedge that we use that we put on your patients in the operating room. But you can do this in the field by simply ramping a patient up on the stretcher. So putting them in reverse Trendelenburg, putting the head up, or by putting a bunch of pillows and sheets underneath their, their upper back and head. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see a picture of this, uh, of what we've done in the operating room. Uh, next slide, please. So this patient, uh, this picture from the Troop website, which shows kind of uh, what I mean by that. So this is from a bariatric surgical center. Here you have a very obese patient in the operating room, ready to be operated on. All that abdominal uh, girth is pushing down on the chest. And you can also see from positioning that that ear is much, 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 much lower than the sternal angle as well. So two things that are fighting against us here. So in the bottom, we're going to put a Troop pillow on, which is this big wedge that we have. And what you can see in the bottom right picture is a line going from the uh, tragus of the ear, so the ear lobe, right to the uh, sternal angle, so that, that position on the, the front of this rib cage. And what that does is it's going to raise up all that, um, sorry, it's going to raise up the head and decompress the abdomen to allow those lungs to expand a lot better. And in this position, as I said before, it'll help align all the axes in the airway, the oral axis, the pharyngeal axis, and the laryngeal axis to allow better, uh, better air conduit for air to come in. And you know, obviously in St. John, we don't have these two pillows. These are, these are what we use in the operating room, but you can create one of these by just shoving a bunch of blankets underneath the upper back and the head to really ramp someone up. You can make your own true uh, pillow in the field really easily with this. If you have a patient on a stretcher, you can put the head of the stretcher up as well. Um, and uh, that'll help with getting a lot of that uh, bone pressure off the abdomen or off the chest. Next slide, please. So the other O is odd faces, odd patients, um, whichever one helps you remember more. And this is basically anyone who has any kind of cranial facial abnormality, whether it's a congenital abnormality, previous injury, um, previous treatment like radiation, something that causes the uh, face to change. So it's not in that normal symmetric a, um, 
uh, an obstructive position. And there's a couple things that will happen. One is that it prevents you from creating good seal because the seal really require uh, with the bag mask because the seal really requires a symmetric face. So as soon as you have something that's abnormal on one side or in the upper portion, you disrupt the plane that you're going to be able to create for the seal. The other thing is that it may actually hide obstruction. You see this more in the patients with uh, in pediatric patients with congenital cranial facial abnormalities where when you have an abnormality on the surface, there's often an underlying abnormality underneath in the airway itself. And that can actually be a source of hidden obstruction because in a patient who's conscious and maintaining a normal airway, but they're just on the borderline for having that obstruction. As soon as they go unconscious, then they have full-blown obstruction because of um, how limited wiggle room there was for that uh, airway. Um, especially in patients who've had previous uh, maybe head and neck radiation. We see this a lot more in the head and neck cancer population or patients who may have um, uh, head and neck um, uh, inflammatory conditions. Uh, smokers especially, they may also have uh, more secretions going on. They'll make it difficult to manage. Now, how do you fix this? Well, you can uh, decrease the amount of mass pressure you're applying when you're bagging and really try to change your mass size to really create something to help fit better. But these are kind of the hardest patients to try and manage because you're kind of having to almost make a gestalt guess as to what's going to be working best in this patient, especially in patients with some of these craniofacial abnormalities. Um, doing your traditional maneuvers like a head tilt or a jaw thrust, you may not actually have the laxity in the ligaments that you need to get that movement and, and create the obstruction. So um, it, it, these are the ones that are going to be uh, really difficult to manage if they are unconscious and we have to provide artificial respirations. Thankfully, not the majority of the patients we're going to be dealing with, but something to keep in mind when you see someone like this in the field. Next slide, please. Okay, no teeth. The edentulous patient, edentulous meaning no teeth. So what, why are these patients difficult? Well, when we have our teeth, or sorry, when we have our mouth closed and we have our teeth totally opposed, so one against each other, this actually helps create a um, mechanical stability for us to pull the jaw up and create that seal because it holds the mandible in place against the upper uh, sorry, against the rest of the skull. If you think about it, the mandible is kind of free floating, held together by all those ligaments. And if you're applying that nice um, jaw thrust pressure up and back, you need something to provide a nice solid seal for it to seat on. And when you have no teeth there, the mandible ends up kind of being free floating as you apply this pressure. And um, it's going to be a lot harder to create that seal because of that. So how do you fix this? Well, you do a good head tilt because you're, you can't use your jaw thrust as much in these uh, patients because you have nothing really to secure your jaw thrust on unless you're kind of securing it into the mask. And I got a picture coming up to show you how you do that. Uh, and the other thing is use an OPA. Just create that channel, take the, take the obstruction off, and uh, ease, the, uh, ease the pressure. Next slide, Dave. So what was that positioning that I talked about before? Well. The normal position of the mask is keeping it, creating a seal along the bottom of the chin and up along the nose. But if you're unable to actually create that seal by creating that mechanical stability against the teeth, that jaw is gonna be kind of flopping all over the place and you're not gonna be able to um, create that seal as effectively. So what you can do is you can kind of slide the mask up to the lower part of the, um, lower part of the lip and then pushing down to open up the mouth and uh, creating kind of a, stabilizing zone in the, um, I guess what's the best term I can use? I guess the valley between the lower lip and the chin. If you kind of feel on yourselves, you can feel that where your chin is, there's a, uh, sorry, where your chin is, you have the nice bony part, but you have a soft tissue kind of bump there, and your lips brought a soft tissue bump, and you're creating that kind of natural valley there. So if you can place a mask right in that valley, and then kind of push the mouth forward a little bit, when you do your jaw thrust, it creates a bit more stability when you, when you do your, um, maneuver. Now that being said, as you can see in the in the um, description of the picture, you still need usually a two-handed grasp to do this effectively because uh, having two hands, you create that seal a lot better and create that stability between your hands, the mask, and the patient's face. And um, uh, an OPA will also make your job a lot easier in that position as well because the OPA will help provide some of that stability that isn't there from the fact that there's no teeth. Next slide. Okay, um, almost done with the mnemonic. E for elderly. Um, when, as patients get older, they lose a lot of that elasticity and, and um, connective tissue that's in the face, and it becomes 
uh, more floppy. And this is what happens with aging. This is why wrinkles occur. This is why um, people get really sallow faces when they age. And what it means is that you, ha you basically lose a lot of that nice puffiness that keeps the cheeks up and helps create that seal against the mask. And you get this sallowness that can occur, especially in the cheeks. And what can happen is, is that as you, uh, as you lose that tissue mass from your cheeks, you allow a natural pocket for air flow to come out. Or not, not pocket, but a hole or a conduit for air to come out. What it means is that you're having to apply a tighter seal of the mask, really try to bag harder so that you can get the air in, but you're just creating this massive leak that occurs of the cheeks. So how do you fix that? Well, you can use an OPA to help decrease the amount of pressure you need to drive the air in. You can do a good head tilt, again, just to optimize your positioning, and you can do an offside mask. And especially if you do a two-handed technique, you can really kind of um, trap a lot of that soft tissue and kind of push it up into the mask to create that seal a little bit better by grabbing, grabbing a lot of that kind of loose skin and pushing it up into the mask, especially with the, with the VE grip more than the CE grip. Next slide, Dave. And the last patient is patient who snores, uh, specifically the patient with OSA. OSA is obstructive sleep apnea. It's a complex um, uh, kind of group of diseases that uh, create obstruction when a patient sleeps. What this means is that when patients are in a lower state of consciousness, so sleeping or fully unconscious or semi-conscious, they lose a lot of that intrinsic muscle tone that keeps their pharynx open and keeps uh, the tongue off the back of the throat or uh, the uvula and upper soft palate off the back of the throat. And what this does is this creates snoring. And that's why uh, a lot of people snore. When people are snoring, there's essentially a small small obstruction that's occurring at the top, but for the majority of patients, it's not an issue because they're still able to get good air in and out. But in some patients, that obstruction is so bad that they actually stop breathing. Or some of them stop breathing, but they stop having a clear effort. And when we bring these, uh, sorry, not effort, um, a clear air path. And when we bring these patients into the sleep lab, and we do studies on them, what you see is that there's still effort to breathe. They're still breathing. They're still trying to draw in that breath. But because they're obstructed at the top, they're not actually able to, to, to draw it in. Uh, and they get obstructed until they finally take a big enough breath that they overcome that obstruction and they get this <gasps> deep breath in. And this is very characteristic of, of one of the forms of OSA. And you get this obstructive sleep apnea because you have periods of obstruction during sleep and periods of apnea. And... Um, I can do a whole talk on OSA because I deal with it all the time, especially in the post-operative setting, but I'll, uh, I'll leave that there. But suffice to say, um, uh, patients are basically at higher risk of obstructing in semi-conscious and unconscious states. And you might need higher pressure to overcome that obstruction. So how do you fix this? Well, good head tilt chin lift, really open up the back of the pharynx as much as you can. In certain OPA or NPA, I would suggest maybe the NPA might be a little bit better here because sometimes it has to do with the snoring is caused more from the upper nasopharyngeal area than it is the, the tongue. So this might help provide a bit more of a bit more of a, a route for air to come in and ramp them up, mostly because the majority of patients with uh, OSA, one of the risk factors is obesity. So if you if you have an obese patient with OSA, then ramping them is also going to help. Um, provide a clear channel for air. Next slide, Dave. So really what I want you to remember as you think about all these patients and ways that you can optimize your your uh, positioning is it shouldn't be a question of if you should use an OPA. Next slide, Dave. Is that you should check to make sure that you're using an OPA. It's much better when, <laughs> when I do this in person. Uh, so I want you to think back to the start of uh, this uh, bones mnemonic that I had where I had the picture of Santa Claus there. So think of Santa Claus as being the hardest person in the world to bag mass ventilate because he's got a big bushy beard. He's obese from eating all those cookies when he's flying around at night. He's got no teeth because he's had his cavities and had all his teeth pulled from eating all those cookies. He is uh, definitely elderly. He's been around for who knows how many thousands of years. And he most definitely snores just because of his body habitus. And he's tired from working up all night. Um, yeah. Uh, now I've seen some questions pop up here, so maybe now would be a good time to answer some of them. Okay. Um, is that what makes surgery for people who are obese more dangerous, potential airway compromise? Yes, most definitely. Good question. So yeah, so when we have patients coming to the operating room for surgery and um, they're at high risk of uh, complications, um, obesity itself provides a number of 
uh, complications in the perioperative period. But one of the ones that we uh, worry about specifically is airway management. And uh, specifically because these patients are at higher risk of obstruction in the perioperative and postoperative period, um, because a little bit of uh, narcotic or sedative can uh, obstruct the airway. There's a whole host of other issues why obese patients are at higher risk of um, uh, perioperative complications. The surgery itself is more difficult. It's harder to get IV access in patients. Monitoring can be an issue, so normal blood pressure cuff may not fit around the arm. So sometimes we have to place a special type of um, uh, catheter, which is a little plastic tube, into the artery. So either in the radial artery or brachial artery um, to measure their blood pressure. They're at higher risk of wound infection. I can go on and on and on about obesity. But um, yeah, airway is definitely one of the big things that we think about uh, in these patients. Um, would OSA patients be a candidate for PEEP at higher levels of care? Yes. So in patients with OSA, when they get when they um, get treated for OSAs, they get a CPAP machine or in some cases a BiPAP machine. CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. PEEP is positive end exploratory pressure. They're essentially the exact same thing. It just has to do with what device is delivering it. If I'm using a ventilator in the operating room, I'm using PEEP. If I have a CPAP machine that I'm giving to a patient who's going home, I'm applying CPAP. But essentially what it is, is it's a continuous positive airway pressure that's delivered um, by a mask that's sealed on the patient's face or by little uh, nose pillows or by another device that's fixed to the patient. But essentially this provides a constant um, airway pressure that helps splint the airway open and allows clear air to go back. Um, so yeah, they would be a candidate for PEEP. And if you have a beggar with a PEEP valve, it can be very helpful in managing these patients' airways. But I don't think that any of the St. John brigades have those, but if you're working in EHS um, or in the hospital, then a PEEP valve is definitely helpful and helps improve your, your uh, oxygenation as well. But that's beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, last question here, unlike the other examples of bones, which are visual, how would you know they have OSA? Is there a question asked in advance? Yes, there is. You can actually ask a, um, a screening questionnaire if, uh, if the patient's awake. Now, if we're going to be providing artificial respiration to the patient, the patient's going to be asleep, so you might not be able to do it. But um, one, of the, one of the screening tools that we have to detect uh, OSA is the stop-bang score. Stop-bang is another mnemonic. It's actually developed in Canada, in Toronto. Um, uh, in fact, and it's a way that we use to screen patients for OSA. Stop bang is mnemonic. It stands for snoring. Uh, so you ask the patient, do you snore at night? And you have to be, uh, you have to provide the corollary that it has to be snoring that's loud enough to be heard in another room. So this is very extreme snoring. Uh, earlier this morning, I was listening to the radio, uh, and the world record for snoring is 93 decibels, which is slightly softer than a rock concert, but about louder than a chainsaw. So uh, it doesn't have to be that loud, but it has to be loud enough that you can hear it in the next door room. Uh, T in stop bank stands for tired. So does a patient feel tired at, in the morning? And the reason for that is because the patients who are um, having these uh, apneic episodes at night, they never get a good sleep. So they're always restless and waking up in the middle of the night because they can't breathe. And so if you're tired in the morning constantly, then that's a good, uh, that might be a risk factor, or sorry, it might be an indicator that you're having, um, uh, that you have OSA. Um, o stands for observed. So has anyone actually observed you either gasping or stopping breathing in the middle of the night? And uh, P stands for pressure. Uh, and what they mean by that is, are you currently be treating, being treated for high blood pressure? And that's because a common cause of hypertension uh, in obese patients is, um, is uh, uh, obesity. Is that better now? The bang portion, so B is BMI, BMI greater than 35, BMI is body mass index. You calculate that based on a um, calculation for the patient's height and weight. Uh, a is age, so age over 55 is a risk factor. 
and his next circumference, so 47, I believe it's 47 centimeters in women and 48 centimeters in males, if your neck is greater than that circumference. And last is G for gender. Males have a higher risk than women, uh, than females do. So what you do is you do this little stop bang score. And if, you're, if your score is three or less, you have a low chance of having OSA. If your score is five or greater, you have a high chance of having moderate to severe OSA. Sorry, that was a little that was a little off topic, but it's uh, um, uh, so. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I, it's an interesting topic that I like talking about. Uh, it's OSA specific to obese patients. It's higher likelihood that it's in obese patients for the specific type of obstructive sleep apneas, but there are other causes of sleep apneas, and you can be a totally um, normal BMI or even low BMI, so an underweight patient, and still have OSA depending on the architecture of your upper face. So obesity is a very high risk factor, but um, it doesn't mean that all obese patients have OSA, and it doesn't mean that all patients with OSA are obese either. Good questions, guys. That's great. Um, let's go to the... Oh, one more. Does a person with OSA have night terrors? Could answer after the course. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe not an expert in night terrors or sleep, uh, sleep disordered breathing. I'm going to have to uh, channel that one for later. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Dave. Okay, so we've talked about how you can manage these airways in terms of opening the airway, clearing it, protecting it, and providing bag mass ventilation. But there's a whole host of other ways that you can manage the airway that's mostly seen at the higher level. So physicians, nurses, um, paramedics, uh, and things we can do. And the... Um, slide on the left kind of shows you the percentage of patients that are difficult to manage with all different types of airway management techniques. And this is taken from operating room data. So skilled practitioners in the operating room doing it. And what you, I want you to notice is that um, the majority of patients are going to be able to be managed by normal bag mass ventilation. Uh, in that, if you look there, only 0.01 to 0.15% of patients are going to be impossible to bag mass ventilate. And the table on the right, which is from my anesthesia textbook, looks to see, well, what are criteria for someone who's difficult to bag mass ventilate? And again, the top one is the inability of one anesthesiologist to maintain oxygen saturation greater than 90%. And we look at the highest risk for that, it's actually the presence of a beard, surprisingly. And that's simply because you can't create that seal against the patient's face. So patients with beards are gonna be very difficult to bag mass ventilate, and those are ones where you're gonna be wanting to get all the tools you can. But note that the second highest one is gonna be high BMI, because you're fighting against all that extra tissue, not only in the abdomen, but also in the upper face and neck, that's gonna be compressing, compressing the, the path down. Next slide, please. Um, so what's this all this uh, what's all this fuss about bag mass ventilation? Why am I making this big big effort on bag mass ventilation? Next slide, Dave. So as I said before, there's uh, you can save more patients with bag mass ventilation than you can with doing all the other airway techniques that we can on them, um, especially in experienced hands. Because as I showed you from the previous slide, there are more patients that you can manage with simple bag mass ventilation that you can't, or that'll be more difficult to manage by placing an oral tracheal tube in. Now, the reason why you place an oral tracheal tube, it completely frees you up from the patient, it protects and secures the airway completely. Um, but if, you, if the patient has uh, no saturation and uh, you need to put an airway in to provide that critical oxygenation, then bag mass ventilation is your best friend. And there's a study that was done in Japan, um, every time I give this talk, I keep saying a few years back, but I think I'm actually dating myself because I think it was actually from 2013, so not, not too long ago. Um, but I looked at out-of-hospital arrests that occurred in Japan and how they were managed. There were 650,000 cardiac arrest patients, and they were looking to see who had um, uh, return to spontaneous circulation. That was, that's what ROSC, R-O-S-C, stands for. And they looked at these patients, they looked to see who was managed with bag mass ventilation, with supraglottic airway or with an entrecheal tube. And they're looking at a bunch of, a bunch of different um, uh, endpoints at the end, survival, functional status, recovery, et cetera. Next slide, Dave. And what they found when they looked at these patients is that patients who were managed with bag mass ventilation alone 
had a 2.6 times greater chance of neuro neurological recovery, uh, neurologically intact survival when compared to endotracheal intubation or supraglottic airway. And I think that neurologically intact survival is important because just because you survive a cardiac arrest doesn't mean that you're going to be the same as before. You might survive, but you might have significant brain damage from, from a hypoxic event, from, from not getting the oxygen that you need at the time. And so the study showed that the patients who are managed with just bag mass ventilation alone um, had a higher chance of, of having a neurologically intact recovery. Um, and there are probably a number of reasons for this. Um, one is that when you, when you do an advanced airway technique, whether it's intubation, placing a breathing tube, or uh, placing a supraglottic airway device like a king tube, you're, you're, you're having to pause. CPR and pause all those other critical interventions that are going to get the heart started again. And we all know that the sooner you can intervene on a patient by delivering that critical defibrillation or starting CPR, the better the chance of recovery is going to be to a perfusing rhythm. Uh, next slide, Dave. Now, the, the grain of salt with this study before you think that bag mass ventilation, the, the holy grail or panacea of resuscitation is that, um, especially in um, a lot of the way that cardiac arrests are managed both in the in the field and in the hospital is that intubation usually occurs after a prolonged arrest. And what that means is that unless you have someone with air, advanced air experience standing right next to you when you drop down, the first thing that's going to happen is going to be CPR, the next thing is going to be defib, and then someone's going to come arrive, maybe start begging, and then maybe the arrest goes on longer, and then we're going to like, okay, let's go prepare to intubate this patient. Uh, then you have to pause CPR to do the intubation. So usually the patients who are getting intubated are the ones that are having longer arrests or who have been down for a longer time and then are having a longer arrest to begin with. So it's kind of hard to see whether it's the fact there is a, is a bag mass ventilation only that's providing the better outcome, or is the fact that these patients being intubated would have had a worse outcome anyway, because they just have a worse prognosis in the end. Um, more, more to come on this, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, afterwards, but I still think that it just shows you that what's most important in the cardiac arrest patient is early CPR, early defibrillation, providing some form of supplemental oxygenation, and really all those other, other things that are important in the, in the chain of survival from, from, uh, from the uh, Heart Institute. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about supraglottic airways. This is definitely an advanced skill, more for um, paramedics, nurses in hospital, and any physicians that are here as well, although uh, if there are, it, definitely uh, I'd like to know but um, it's just something that you might see especially if you're in the field and you have a down patient and you call uh, EHS to come they come they plunk this device into the airway and you're wondering what the heck is that thing well they, I'll just go over a little bit here so supraglottic airways are um, the perfect descriptor because it tells you exactly what the device is it's a airway so a tube that's uh, gonna be sitting supraglottically so that means above the glottis the glottis is where your um, uh, is where the air passage between your trachea and your upper larynx. So it's basically the opening into your windpipe. So this is a tube that sits above your windpipe and uh, provides a conduit for respiration. Now you might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound much different from an OPA. And uh, an OPA is essentially a very small supraglottic airway device. Um, the supraglottic airways, in these sense, create a better seal and help provide a method for secure positive pressure ventilation, i.e. something that you can hook up to a bag mask ventilator and provide, uh, sorry, a bag and mask and provide positive pressure more effectively than just having a, an oral airway where you have to then create a seal with a mask on the face. Um, two most common ones that we're seeing out in EHS right now is a LMA, which stands for a laryngeal mask airway. And again, the, the name tells you what it is. Laryngeal mask, so it's a mask that sits in the back of the mouth and essentially cups the larynx and helps create a seal much, much, much lower down and allows you to effectively ventilate the patient that way. It has an inflatable bowl that sits and cups that area and it bypasses the tongue and allows you to ventilate the patient through there. Um, the king tube is a tube that has two inflatable cuffs on it, one uh, that sits in the pharynx and one that sits kind of lower down near the entrance of the esophagus and has a hole between those two tubes that air can go in and out of and provides ventilation. Now, a picture's worth a thousand words, so next slide, next slide, Dave. This will probably give you a better sense of what they are. So here are the two devices in situ in these pictures. There we have the LMA on the left, laryngeal mask airway, and 
just like what a mask from a bag and mask looks like. There's the mask, but it's sitting there and it's cupping the larynx. And in the king tube on the right, you can see that there's two balloons there, one just behind the tongue and one in the uh, lower part of the esophagus. And between the two, there's an opening that uh, you can have the, for air to go in and out of the trachea, as long as that opening is lined up nicely with the opening of the trachea. Next slide, Dave. Um, here's just showing you more what an LMA looks like when it's not in a patient. Um, so there's that cup with a hole in the center and a flexible tubing up to a connector that you can hook up to a bag mask. Next slide, Dave. And there's what the king tube looks like, kind of same kind of thing, uh, except there's no cup or bowl this time. It's just two balloons that you can plonk in and uh, there's the airway inlet that you can use to provide artificial respiration. Next slide, Dave. So, um, I'm just mentioning this because this is what we're seeing used a lot more in out of hospital arrests, especially for our uh, uh, basic life support uh, ambulance crews. And um, we use these in the operating room as a rescue device. So what I mean by that is like, if there's a patient that we can't intubate, we can't bag mass ventilate, well then the next thing that we do is we plunk one of these in. But we also use them in a non-emergency setting. We'll use them in patients that we don't want to intubate, but we want to provide a way of providing artificial respiration in an elective setting. So patient coming in for, uh, like I might use it for example, in a patient who's coming for a quick knee scope, needs to go to sleep for the procedure, but I don't want to put a breathing tube in because um, it's going to be a quick procedure and I don't want to give them all the drugs I need to do to do that. Well, this is an alternate that I can do. But in the field, so in uh, out of hospital arrests, where a patient's unable to be intubated and they need to provide a more uh, definitive airway, although I would argue that the screw-like airways aren't definitive, um, these can be placed and they are being placed by our EHS crews. Uh, and there's a study that came out of, I believe this was in the States somewhere, that looked at use of an LMA, sclerodigital mask airway, versus a king tube. And um, king tube had higher success rates, so 96% uh, chance of first pass success insertion versus the LMA, which is A7. So not bad, not good. And it really has to do with what, what can you be trained on to use effectively. Next slide, Dave. So what we're seeing now is this device called eye gel. And um, BC Ambulance, maybe Dave, you can, you can speak to this a little bit more uh, after the talk, but um, uh, BC Ambulance starting to use these. And, and we use them a little bit in the OR. And it's essentially a LMA, so the laryngeal mask airway, but the cup, instead of being an inflatable balloon that you have to inflate, is made of this moldable gel that kind of, uh, when you insert in the back of the pharynx, um, heats up and kind of molds itself to create a seal around the, the glottis. Um, and it's a lot less traumatic having to be inserted. This is what we call third generation LMA because it's got all these fancy little, like gastric channels and a bite block. And the coolest thing is it has a conduit for intubation. So what I mean by that is that the hole that you, the air goes in and out of is actually big enough that I can snake a breathing tube along with a camera down and place a breathing tube that way in, uh, in extreme circumstances. So a really cool little tool, but something I just thought I'd show because these are kind of the, the fun things that we, we, we get to play around with in the, uh, in the hospital and operating room. Next slide, Dave. And um, there's a lot more evidence coming out that management of supraglottic airways may be more beneficial than intubating a patient in an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So o OHCA stands for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. There are two trials that came out recently, both, in, uh, both were reported in Journal of in uh, JAMA, and both came out in 2018. One was in the UK, one was in the US, and it compared intracranial intubation versus different types of, of uh, superglottic airways. And everyone was kind of hoping that these would show a lot more than they did, and airways, the Airways 2 trial probably showed more than, than the PART trial. And I think there, the authors note that there were a lot of confounders in here because they didn't have complete standardization for these patients because in an arrest, you really can't standardize everyone. Um, and essentially, it showed no difference between the two, maybe a slight signal towards supraglottic airway devices. But they want, what they did find from these cardiac arrest trials is that there was a lot, only about a third of the patients had bystander CPR. Uh, and there was a big delay in starting CPR. There were, there were interruptions in CPR to, to put these devices in. And so I think, I think that more so just shows you that for, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, which is what we're going to be dealing with, that the most important thing is going to be uh, good CPR, early defibrillation, and and providing some form of passive oxygenation, even as even as that's just holding that that bag and mask on the patient's face and, and providing passive uh, passive inflow that way. Um, 
when when we do these uh, arrests in hospital, at least when I have to go and manage these patients on the ward, I'll just get them to keep doing CPR while I'm trying to intubate this patient, which while challenging means that we don't have to interrupt compressions for intubation. Or if I'm unable to intubate that way, I'll prepare myself to intubate and try to keep my intubation attempt to less than five seconds if I can. Next slide, Dave. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide because this is probably well, well beyond the scope of this talk. So we'll just skip ahead. We'll skip ahead this one as well. Uh, yeah, so, uh, we might as well. Okay, so uh, I guess the big thing is, is if you are using one of these advanced airways in your job, not, not in St. John where you're just practicing at power level, but in EHS or in the hospital um, and you have one of these devices in, just to have, make sure there's somebody designated to look after it because we don't want just somebody bumping it or moving the patient and while you're holding the bag and all of a sudden the tube pops out and now you have to do the whole thing over again. Um, but the same can be said about protecting the airway. So if you've been given the airway and you're providing that good jaw thrust and bagging, you look after that airway and you make sure it's protected. Because um, everyone else is always looking forward to doing other sorts of things. Next slide, Dave. Uh, let's skip this one as well. Okay, so um, that's the that's the end of the talk. And I, I was trying to provide a nice overview of key interventions that we can do in the primary survey for airway management. And I just wanted to show you that there's a whole host of other things that we can do for airway management. This is the Anesthesia Society of America difficult airway algorithm. So this is what, one of the things that I use when I look at how am I going to be managing a patient airway. And it's complicated and convoluted and I like the Canadian one a lot more, but um, just want to show you there's a whole bunch of host of options that we have to deal with. But uh, in the, at the end of the day, it comes down to opening the airway plumping an OPA in and providing good bag mass ventilation with a good CE or VE clamp. Next slide, Dave. And that's, uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, again, with the, the usual disclaimer that a lot of these things are advice for pre-COVID era. Fundamentals will still be there post-COVID, um, but will probably be different, probably with us using more, more PPE. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Let's start in the chat right now. So... Uh, I'm going I'm to leave that night terrace one because, again, I don't have enough uh, background info on sleep, uh, sleep disorder breathing to answer that. Uh, but in the OR, do you not shave a patient first? No, not, not routinely. We do sometimes suggest if we're seeing a patient and they have a big um, bushy beard that we, uh, we sometimes will suggest that we shave, the, uh, if the patient can shave beforehand, that'll make our job easier. But, you know, sometimes uh, gentlemen have been, have been growing beards all their lives and they're quite proud of it. So... And we do a kind of risk assessment. And I think, well, this patient may be difficult for me to bag mass ventilate, but they don't have any sense of me being able to get a, it, to intubate the patient, so get a breathing tube in um, by my normal methods, or I don't see any difficult predictors of me being able to use a superglottic airway device in them. So, and then I'll just put them off to sleep. And if I can't bag them, I'll put a breathing tube in or a superglottic airway device in. If we're very concerned about a patient and they have, risk factors for difficult bag mass ventilation and difficult um, intubation and difficult supraglottic airway device, and I really don't want to have to be going to cutting the neck in an emergency, then what we'll do is we'll do an awake intubation, usually by using a fiber optic camera to insert a breathing tube while the patient's awake, and then we put them to sleep afterwards. Uh, next question here. So if LMAs are not successful as King, uh, as King why are we moving to them less damage on insertion? Yeah, so the, that, that study that looked at um, LMA versus King tube was looking at first generation LMAs, which are, which at the time when they were invented in 1978 were totally revolutionary. But King tubes were invented, I wanna say sometime in the 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and they were really a second a step up. And, and with all these superglottic airway devices, SGAs, we have first generation, second generation, now we're into third generation. So there are LMAs that are third generation that are better than the King tube, um, like the iGel. Um, there's uh, the, um, uh, the company that actually makes like the proprietary company for LMAs, they make one called the LMA Protector, which is an awesome one. It has an inflatable cuff, but it's got a bunch of other features in it that makes it easier for insertion. So, um, uh, so I, I, and I see, you know, maybe Dave can speak to this a little bit more about what BC Ambulance is doing, but I've seen a little bit from beam tubes to using more eye gels, just because they are easier to place. They do cause less trauma going in. Um, and you can get a much more, uh, a bit more security when you place it just because of how it's, how it's placed and it's a little bit more um, uh, moldable, as we say. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in there for two seconds. So we're currently in the process of transitioning from the king tubes to the eye gels. Uh, the, eye gel, the king tubes are largely being phased out, not because of difficulty in actually placing them, uh, but there's some concerns around actual blood flow going back through to the head. And because the kings have a balloon that expands in the upper airway, there's concern and it's been shown in pig models that actually creates pressure up on the carotid <laughs> arteries, which prevent blood flow returning to the brain. And so the protocol they found after that study turned out took two practitioners and a whole lot of fiddling around, slowly reducing off pressure until you're finding just the right balance to seal. And so it was creating a whole lot of work, whereas the eye gels are as simple as unpack it, put lubricant over the back surface of it, drop it in, and it's done. Uh, I was working at a station that was trialing them when they were considering rolling them out, and we used them a few times. And they really are as straightforward as that. Um, it's a very, very quick, typically one to two provider insertion process, and it just moves right along that way. Um, so it's not necessarily just the ease of placement, but it's the ongoing management of it as well. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like, I don't, uh, I have to admit, I don't, I've used, and I'll, I've used a king tube three times in my entire career just because we use LMAs in the, in the OR much more and we're just more comfortable with them. And there's various different types of LMAs that we can use. The king tube was really developed as a, as an out of hospital thing. And, and as good, I'm glad you brought those, those, um, those studies, Dave, because there was some concern even with LMAs that might be occurring. And especially for out of hospital arrests where you really want to preserve uh, perfusion to the brain. Um, be, uh, that could be really important. And in the operating room, we have fancy um, manometers that we can use to check the pressure in the cuff. But if you don't have that in the field and you're just trying to plunk something in, having an eye gel that you can drop in and it'll mold and you don't have to worry about that is, uh, is much better. Any other, uh, any other uh, questions there? I'll, get, I'll give a few seconds here in case anyone's trying to type. Well, for typing. Oh. Uh, using the Go ahead. Do, yeah, yeah, we're using the new address. So just while if everyone, anyone's giving a chance, uh, just a couple quick things. These are, sessions are being recorded. They're being posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, they are all public, so you can go back and watch, I think, the last four or five weeks of them we've got scheduled now. We've got in the past now and use them to pass it along. Uh, up on the screen right now, there's our contact information. We'll leave it up there for a little bit to write it down. Um, please do pass this along to your colleagues. We're, I think, having our peak at 50 people today, which is the most we've had in one. We're really excited about these. Uh, next week, we're going to be going from someone like Dr. Chima, who's an expert in their field, to someone who's fully mediocre in their field, which is me. Uh, I'll be talking about drowning, uh, near drowning, and water-related emergencies. Um, so we're very happy for you guys to have been here. Uh, we do also have social media uh, for our division, which I'll include here. You can follow us across Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram through all of these. Uh, we're up posting updates about our current training, as well as once the world gets a little bit back more to normal, we'll be posting more about the beauties and that we're a part of. Um, don't Thanks see any day. other questions popping up. I don't see uh, any more. Um, I will be, uh, as I said, I will be coming to uh, Toronto in July. Who knows when social isolation and restrictions but um if they can come see each other i'll be happy to i'd be happy to come and um or uh not ha and meet you guys uh over there when uh when the time comes uh thanks also big shout out to dave for um for being my slide clicker and advancer uh work got in the way but i'm glad you were able to make this happen well to a special thank you to all the folks from ontario i think we've seen five or six people who it's almost midnight now and they're still willing to come out for this so thank you guys really for showing up we appreciate it Right. Have a good night, everyone. Well, we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you so much, Nav. We really appreciate it. Have a great night, everyone. We'll talk to you next week.